In this episode, a young university student enjoys scuba diving off Australia's coastline. Diving into the deep blue, visibility is poor. The colorful fish and scenic coral reef are a distraction for the team of divers. They fail to spot a predator heading their way. It's on the hunt, and it homes in on its prey, the divers. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. This is the terrifying shark attack on Jonathan Lee. Welcome to Final Affliction. It was the weekend, Sunday, September 8, 1991. Jonathan Lee was a 19-year-old second-year student at Adelaide University in South Australia. He was from the northeastern suburb of One Tree Hill. He and his mates enjoyed their weekends off from studying. It meant they could explore the surrounding area, have a break from lectures, and take a boat out into the sea to enjoy a spot of diving. This was the perfect way to spend their time off. They drove to Aldinga Beach, 45 kilometers south of Adelaide. From there, they hauled their dive gear into a boat and motored out from shore. The sky was clear, the air was warm, the group of friends laughed and chatted as the sea breeze blew their hair and the salt spray splashed into their faces. They were heading 350 meters offshore to a well-known dive spot simply called the Drop-Off. The golden sands at Eldinga Beach gave way to intertidal rock flats that extended offshore as a reef. Here, the depth dropped into an inky blue. Colorful fish swam amongst beautiful corals. Sea stars and sea urchins clung to the rocks. Groupers lurked below the overhangs and hid in the dark caves. Snappers swam past in their shoals, heading to their breeding grounds. Each snapper can grow up to 1.3 meters or 4 feet in length and weigh 20 kilograms or 44 pounds. They were easy prey for sharks. Where there were snappers, there were likely to be great white sharks in hot pursuit. When the group spotted the sea turn from a light blue to a deep, dark color, they knew they had reached the edge of the reef. They lowered the anchor, and each diver pulled their mask over their face, checked their regulator, and rolled off the side of the boat. Bubbles escaped from Jonathan's wetsuit as he submerged below the surface. The cool seawater engulfed him as he sank lower in the water column. The group of friends spread out as they each explored the reef. It was a beautiful underwater scene, the brightly colored fish flitting this way and that, a green sea turtle nibbling at sea lettuce growing from the side of the reef. Beyond the drop-off was the eerie blue expanse of the open ocean. But something nearby was on the hunt. A great white shark was drawn to the reef to prey on the fish. They were easy prey and abundant closer to shore. On this particular day, despite the perfect conditions above the water, the sea was murky. Silt and sediment had been churned up from the sea floor, making visibility relatively poor. Twenty minutes into the dive, four of the friends headed back to the boat. They had seen enough. It had been a refreshing dip, and now they climbed out of the sea and sat on the boat, pulling off their dive gear. They patiently waited for the rest of the team to finish their dive. The remaining members of the group continued to view the amazing underwater wildlife. One of the more senior divers in the team was 30-year-old Dave Roberts. Not much later, he too decided to head for the boat. But as he began to swim back, he noticed something. It was a large, colorful rock that caught his eye. He swam down to take a closer look, and that's when he witnessed the shark attack. He didn't see it at first. Instead, what had caught his attention was a strange sound. It was like a booming of thunder, an ominous rumble. He looked upwards at the light penetrating the sea surface. Was it a boat powering through the water above them? The sound of its engine roaring and vibrating through the water column? That's what it sounded like. But when Dave looked up, he didn't see any sign of a boat. He looked below him, near the bottom of the reef. That's when he saw it. He saw an enormous great white shark. It was thrashing its head from side to side near the sea bottom, likely eating a grouper or a snapper. As its whole body arced and crashed, its tail whipped up sand from the seabed. A cloud of sand and silt surrounded the shark, obscuring Dave's view. He watched, fascinated by the attack, 
His heart thundered in his chest as he witnessed a top predator furiously on the hunt, just meters from where he swam. Then the cloud of silt and sand turned red as blood filled the surrounding water. This was no attack on a fish, this was something much larger. With his heart in his mouth, Dave suddenly realized this could be one of the team. He was filled with a sense of dread, a terrible feeling that he was witnessing one of his friends being mauled to death right before his eyes. But there was nothing he could do. He had no weapon. He had no way of distracting the shark or diverting its attention. He took a defensive position. There was no way he was going to swim back to the boat now. The most dangerous time of any dive is when the diver resurfaces. That's when they're at their most vulnerable. That's when most shark attacks happen. The shark was in full attack mode, and all Dave could do was hide. He crouched down behind the large, colorful rock he had swum down to inspect in the first place. Hardly daring to breathe, he peered over the top of the rock, clinging onto its side with his gloved hands. Then the shark turned towards Dave. He crouched down further. The bubbles escaped from his mouthpiece, a giveaway to his position. He held his breath. Then he saw a sight that shook him to his core. Inside the shark's mouth was Jonathan, his dive buddy. Jonathan's body was limp and lifeless as the shark swam powerfully past Dave. He could see its eyes, dark black. It didn't look at him. It already had its catch. It stared, unblinking ahead as it passed within two feet of Dave. If he had stretched out his arm, he would have been able to touch it. Dave needed to get to the surface. He needed to warn the others and check that everyone else was okay. When the shark was out of sight, he made a dash for the surface. He propelled himself upwards with his flippers. His legs ached as he kicked furiously, the lactic acid building up, the burning sensation growing until finally he burst through the water into the warm air above. He pulled out his regulator. Shark! Shark! He screamed at the dive boat. The four friends already on board leapt into action. 18-year-old Ben Peterson hauled up the anchor and immediately motored over to Dave. Leaning over the side of the boat, the friends pulled him on board. As they did so, they noticed something floating in the water. Then something else, and something else. It was a dive fin, an oxygen tank, and some torn wetsuit. The tank was undamaged, not a sign of a scratch or a dent, but the air hose had been severed right by the regulator. In stunned silence, the five of them stared in disbelief for a few heartbreaking seconds at the equipment bobbing through the sea. The three remaining members of the group had also witnessed the attack. Just like Dave, they had taken a defensive position during the attack. They had seen the shark on top of Jonathan. It was as though it had pinned him to the floor as it bit into him, shaking him violently from side to side. When it was over, they too made a mad dash for the boat. The group quickly pulled themselves into the boat, breathless, shocked, and stunned. It could have been any one of them. They were lucky to be alive. They grabbed a flare and fired it into the air to signal for help. There was no sign of Jonathan now. He had been taken into the depths. The group searched the sea from the safety of the boat. They hoped that by some miracle Jonathan would pop up to the surface, having survived the terrible attack. But it wasn't to be. Sadly, Jonathan was never seen again. When the group made it back to dry land, they called the authorities. An extensive search was conducted to try and find any trace of the young student. Apart from a few body tissues found floating in the sea near the site of the attack, nothing was ever found. The only thing left of Jonathan was the horrifying story of his final affliction.